So how many of you read the obituaries on a daily basis? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, one of my first journalism jobs required me to write obituaries. Um, if I was in the office and the phone rang, I picked it up, and the first time I had to do this, I treated it like it was Watergate. Yes, what was his name? How, what, what did he do? You know, and I learned that actually there's a template to this. The funeral directors call, they say, this is so-and-so funeral home, and I have an obit for you, and then it was name, age, uh, visitation, funeral, survivors, flowers, no flowers, and you're done. Took me five minutes to take it down, five minutes to write it up, send it off to the editor, and then I go back to whatever story I was writing, and then, you know, phone ringing again, hello, this is the funeral home, okay, go ahead. Became a very impersonal kind of, of rote task. And I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, if you've ever wondered, like, when a celebrity or someone famous dies, how they get an obituary up on the web so quickly, it's because it's already written. Um, there are obituaries out there for Kanye West, Jerry Seinfeld, Donald Trump. They're already written. And all you have to do is just put a top on them. And if somebody dies, whoops, he's, he's dead. You put uh, that he's dead, the date, age, hit send. The problem is, it's so easy to put a top on an obituary and hit send. Uh, recently, Terry Gilliam, a filmmaker with uh, uh, the troupe Monty Python, uh, was reported in a British newspaper as being dead. And uh, he's still very much alive. And he issued a statement, I apologize for dying. <laughs> so obituaries, uh, you know, are, are a becoming sort of a lost art because as newspapers shrink, uh, there are fewer and fewer print obituaries. Um, often, for example, in the News and Observer of Raleigh, they just list, they do list. And the longer obituaries are often written by the families. Some of these can be very, very colorful. Again, for most reporters, it's an impersonal task. It's one more thing you do in your day. You take it, you record it, you put it in there. I was working in my last full-time position uh, as a reporter some years ago at the Jacksonville, North Carolina Daily News down where Camp Lejeune is and walked into work one morning and my editor uh, said, Anthony, a prominent businessman has died. Uh, he was killed this morning on the job. Go talk to his family. I did not want to do that. Suddenly, the impersonal task of writing an obituary became very personal. I have never dreaded anything more in my life. I'd like to read the opening lines of the story I wrote and then talk to you a little bit about the experience of talking to grieving relatives literally hours after a man has been in a tragic accident. The portrait one gets of Morris Jacobs after listening to friends and family who knew him well is that of a man who was reserved, dependable, and extremely hardworking. Although he never finished high school, he was considered wise, and he saw to it that his own children were provided with the means to a college education. He and his wife, Doris, had six children, four sons and two daughters. And they say he made time for all of them. Perhaps he wanted such a large family because he liked having people around. His daughter, Sharon Collins, 29, told of how he threw a pig picking every 4th of July and invited nearly everybody he knew. He did the cooking himself, Sharon said, demonstrating one of his many talents he liked to share with others. Those same people who celebrated and broke bread with Morris Jacobs over the years came to mourn him this week. A well-known and respected member of the Swansboro community, Jacobs, 59, was killed early Wednesday when the bed of a dump truck he was working on closed and crushed his throat. This was not a man who just died. This was a man who uh, was a hard worker, loving husband, large family, many friends, prominent businessman, loved to tinker with things, even though he was one of the owners of the company and semi-retired. He got up early one morning and he went to work on a dump truck for his business that wasn't working properly. As he was leaning over, the bed came down and effectively decapitated him and I had to get up and go and talk to his family. 
I drove to his place of business first, and I walked in. There was a semicircle of about a dozen people just standing there, staring at the floor, not even talking to each other. I walked in, and they all looked up at the stranger intruding on their grief. I said, my name is Anthony Hatcher. I'm with the Daily News. I'm sorry to bother you at this horrible time, but I'd like to get some information about, uh, about Mr. Jacobs. And so one of the managers agreed to talk to me. We went to a separate room, pulled out my pen and pad, took some notes for about 20 minutes, and I said, I have a tremendous favor to ask of you. I need to go and talk to the family. I didn't tell him this, but I thought, it's my job. It's my job. My editor wants me to talk to the family. I have to go talk to the family. So I said, would you please call them and ask if I could come over? So he said, all right. I could tell he did not want me to go. It's like you are intruding on us. But he called, and uh, they said, come on over. So I drove over to the house, and it was even worse than the people standing in the business. There were 50 to 60 cars lined up and down the street, parked all over the yard. And I thought, oh, great. And so I parked my car, hiked up to the house, knocked on the door, and I was greeted at the door by the two daughters, two adult daughters in their late 20s. And they saw me. They, I was the only stranger among the hundred or so people who were there. And they knew who I was. They knew I was the reporter. And so they opened the door. They didn't even say anything to me. They just opened the door. They kind of took me by the arm. They sat me down on the couch. And I sat between these two young women. They plopped the photograph album on my lap. And for 20 minutes, they just turned pages. This is daddy. This is dad at our wedding. This is dad at a picnic. This is dad and mom. And he just, you know, it, it was, I, I didn't take any notes. I just listened. I just listened. The widow, his wife, sat in an armchair, and she just sat kind of watching me, watching them, never said a word the entire time I was there. I didn't dare ask her any questions. I just listened to the daughters. And that's where I got these quotes from. And after a while, I said, do you mind if I, I take out my notepad? And they said, no. So I took some notes, and there was a particularly nice photograph in there of, of uh, Mr. Jacobs in a suit. And I figured it was probably at a wedding or some other formal affair. I said, may I borrow this? I promise to return it. And they said, sure. So they gave it to me. I shook their hands. I looked at the widow and said, I'm sorry. She sort of nodded, and then I left. Now, reporters get in their cars after covering a story. And uh, many of them do, as I did that day. I got in the car, and on the way back to the paper, I started thinking about my lead. I had a job to do. I had a job to do. So I started thinking about my lead, started thinking about the structure. You notice how I wrote this. It was about four paragraphs in before I ever mentioned how he died. And I did that intentionally, because if I learned anything that day, if I learned anything that day, it was that... Um, obits are not about deaths, they're about life. Thank you.